what they saw in the country of El Dorado. Cacambo expressed his curiosity to the landlord, who made answer, "'I am very ignorant, but not the worse on that account. However, we have in this neighborhood an old man retired from court, who is the most learned and most communicative person in the kingdom.' At once he took Cacambo to the old man. Candide acted now only a second character, and accompanied his valet. They entered a very plain house, for the door was only of silver, and the ceilings were only of gold, but wrought in so elegant a taste as to vie with the richest. The antechamber, indeed, was only encrusted with rubies and emeralds, but the order in which everything was arranged made amends for this great simplicity. The old man received the strangers on his sofa, which was stuffed with hummingbirds' feathers, and ordered his servants to present them with liquors in diamond goblets, after which he satisfied their curiosity in the following terms. "'I am now one hundred and seventy-two years old,' and I learnt of my late father, master of the horse to the king, the amazing revolutions of Peru, of which he had been an eye-witness. The kingdom we now inhabit is the ancient country of the Incas, who quitted it very imprudently to conquer another part of the world, and were at length destroyed by the Spaniards." more wise by far were the princes of their family who remained in their native country and they ordained with the consent of the whole nation that none of the inhabitants should ever be permitted to quit this little kingdom and this has preserved our innocence and happiness the spaniards have had a confused notion of this country and have called it El Dorado, and an Englishman, whose name was Sir Walter Raleigh, came very near it about a hundred years ago, but, being surrounded by inaccessible rocks and precipices, we have hitherto been sheltered from the rapaciousness of European nations, who have an inconceivable passion for the pebbles and dirt of our land, for the sake of which they would murder us to the last man. The conversation was long. It turned chiefly on their form of government, their manners, their women, their public entertainments, and the arts. At length Candide, having always had a taste for metaphysics, made cacambo ask whether there was any religion in that country the old man reddened a little how then said he can you doubt it do you take us for ungrateful wretches cacambo humbly asked what was the religion in el dorado the old man reddened again can there be two religions said he we have i believe the religion of all the world we worship god night and morning do you worship but one god said cacambo who still acted as interpreter in representing candide's doubts surely said the old man there are not two nor three nor four i must confess the people from your side of the world ask very extraordinary questions candide was not yet tired of interrogating the good old man he wanted to know in what manner they prayed to god in el dorado we do not pray to him said the worthy sage we have nothing to ask of him he has given us all we need and we return him thanks without ceasing candide having a curiosity to see the priests asked where they were the good old man smiled my friend 
said he we are all priests the king and all the heads of families sing solemn canticles of thanksgiving every morning accompanied by five or six thousand musicians what have you no monks who teach who dispute who govern who cabal and who burn people that are not of their opinion we must be mad indeed if that were the case said the old man here we are all of one opinion and we know not what you mean by monks during this whole discourse candide was in raptures and he said to himself this is vastly different from westphalia and the baron's castle had our friend pangloss seen el dorado he would no longer have said that the castle of thunderton trunk was the finest upon earth it is evident that one must travel after this long conversation the old man ordered a coach and six sheep to be got ready and twelve of his domestics to conduct the travellers to court excuse me said he if my age deprives me of the honour of accompanying you the king will receive you in a manner that cannot displease you and no doubt you will make an allowance for the customs of the country if some things should not be to your liking candide and cacambo got into the coach the six sheep flew and in less than four hours they reached the king's palace situated at the extremity of the capital the portal was two hundred and twenty feet high and one hundred wide but words were wanting to express the materials of which it was built it is plain such materials must have prodigious superiority over those pebbles and sand which we call gold and precious stones twenty beautiful damsels of the king's guard received candide and cacambo as they alighted from the coach conducted them to the bath and dressed them in robes woven of the down of humming-birds after which the great crown officers of both sexes led them to the king's apartment between two files of musicians a thousand on each side when they drew near to the audience chamber cacambo asked one of the great officers in what way he should pay his obeisance to his majesty whether they should throw themselves upon their knees or on their stomachs whether they should put their hands upon their heads or behind their backs whether they should lick the dust off the floor in a word what was the ceremony the custom said the great officer is to embrace the king and to kiss him on each cheek candide and cacambo threw themselves round his majesty's neck he received them with all the goodness imaginable and politely invited them to supper while waiting they were shown the city and saw the public edifices raised as high as the clouds the market-places ornamented with a thousand columns the fountains of spring water those of rose water those of liquors drawn from sugar-cane incessantly flowing into the great squares which were paved with a kind of precious stone which gave off a delicious fragrancy like that of cloves and cinnamon candide asked to see the court of justice the parliament they told him they had none and that they were strangers to lawsuits he asked if they had any prisons and they answered no but what surprised him most and gave him the greatest pleasure was the palace of sciences where he saw a gallery two thousand feet long and filled with instruments employed in mathematics and physics after rambling about the city the whole afternoon and seeing but a thousandth part of it 
they were reconducted to the royal palace, where Candide sat down to table with his majesty, his valet Cacambo, and several ladies. Never was there a better entertainment, and never was more wit shown at a table than that which fell from his majesty. Cacambo explained the king's bon mot to Candide, and notwithstanding they were translated, they still appeared to be bon mot. Of all the things that surprised Candide, this was not the least. They spent a month in this hospitable place. Candide frequently said to Cacambo, "'I own, my friend, once more that the castle where I was born is nothing in comparison with this. But, after all, Miss Cunegonde is not here, and you have, without doubt, some mistress in Europe.' If we abide here, we shall only be upon a footing with the rest. Whereas, if we return to our old world, only with twelve sheep laden with the pebbles of El Dorado, we shall be richer than all the kings in Europe. We shall have no more inquisitors to fear, and we may easily recover Miss Cunegonde. This speech was agreeable to Cacambo, Mankind are so fond of roving, of making a figure in their own country, and of boasting of what they have seen in their travels, that the two happy ones resolved to be no longer so, but to ask his majesty's leave to quit the country. "'You are foolish,' said the king. "'I am sensible that my kingdom is but a small place, but—' when a person is comfortably settled in any part he should abide there i have not the right to detain strangers it is a tyranny which neither our manners nor our laws permit all men are free go when you wish but the going will be very difficult it is impossible to ascend that rapid river on which you came as by a miracle and which runs under vaulted rocks. The mountains which surround my kingdom are ten thousand feet high, and as steep as walls. They are each over ten leagues in breadth, and there is no other way to descend them than by precipices. However, since you absolutely wish to depart, I shall give orders to my engineers to construct a machine that will convey you very safely. When we have conducted you over the mountains, no one can accompany you further, for my subjects have made a vow never to quit the kingdom, and they are too wise to break it. Ask me, besides, anything that you please. We desire nothing of your majesty, says Candide, but a few sheep laden with provisions, pebbles, and the earth of this country. The king laughed. I cannot conceive, said he, what pleasures you Europeans find in our yellow clay, but take as much as you like, and great good may it do you. At once he gave directions that his engineers should construct a machine to hoist up these two extraordinary men out of the kingdom. Three thousand good mathematicians went to work. It was ready in fifteen days, and did not cost more than twenty million sterling in the specie of that country. They placed Candide and Cacambo on the machine. There were two great red sheep saddled and bridled to ride upon as soon as they were beyond the mountains twenty pack-sheep laden with provisions thirty with presents of the curiosities of the country and fifty with gold diamonds and precious stones the king embraced the two wanderers very tenderly their departure with the ingenuous manner in which they and their sheep were hoisted over the mountains was a splendid spectacle. The mathematicians took their leave after conveying them to a place of safety, and Candide had no other desire, no other aim, than to present his sheep to Miss Cunegonde. "'Now,' said he, 
we are able to pay the governor of buenos aires if miss cunegonde can be ransomed let us journey towards cayenne let us embark and we will afterwards see what kingdom we shall be able to purchase end of chapter eighteen recording by john van stan savannah georgia